everybody, good evening and welcome to your very own Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel. I'm Aishwarya and in our class today, we are going to be recalling and learning the chapter Life Processes and we will do the whole chapter just under 45 minutes. Now we know that life process is a very big chapter and of course on a board examination front this chapter is very very important. So everybody please make sure that you have your notebooks and pens ready with you. If not have your textbooks open with you and a pencil in your hand so that you can make a note of all the important pointers that I am going to be discussing in today's class. So everybody please make sure that you quickly like this video, you hit that subscribe button because trust me Baiju's 9 and 10 has gotten super serious when it comes to your board exams and as a part of revising all of your important chapters we are going to be coming up with some wonderful series right so please make sure you do not forget to like this video and subscribe it's very very important and like in every class I tell you let's have a target of maybe having 100 or 200 likes let's aim for that right so let's aim for having 100 likes on this video yes if not 100 let's go for 200 likes on this video by the end of today's class yes so in 45 minutes we also have a target of hitting 200 likes so do not forget to share this video yes good evening to all my bachas I can see a lot of new faces in the chat some old regular students as well so good evening to everybody yes thank you so much to everyone here yes all right so very quickly everybody I hope my audio my video and my screen and what I've been writing on the screen is visible to all of you if it is please do give me a quick thumbs up yes give me a quick thumbs up in the chat but Charles and we are going to get started okay yes and remember we want to hit 200 likes in 45 minutes it's going to be a new target that we are setting for ourselves and of course doing a lot of learning in the meanwhile so do not forget to like the video yes and keep telling your friends whoever keep joining in in today's class please make sure that you tell them as well now in the live chat I request all of you to be maintaining decorum of class do not get distracted because of course as you know our chat moderator will block you or time you out and later please don't complain okay thank you so much Ajay Kumar I hope you have subscribed to the channel and I hope you love learning right and as you all know yes we have amazing classes in store for you as of now the most important set of classes we're doing is chapter revision under 45 minutes and 1000 PYQs in 50 days right so we have this target set for us and apart from this we have our board examination prep going very strong we will be doing one shots marathons practice all of it coming only in your Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel so do not but just do not forget to subscribe okay very very important right subscribe to this video like this video yes so now of course I'm not going to spend too much time I'm going to get started right now there are few things that I need you all to remember in this class and if any new students new friends come into our class tell them as well now because we have an aim of completing the whole chapter in 45 minutes I will not be taking any questions mid explanation right so what I will do is I will have a doubt board towards the end okay so a doubt board is going to be there towards the end of the class so what I need you all to do is to write down your doubts or write down the parts where you did not understand and I will explain that yes and simultaneously make sure you have your textbooks with you or have your notebooks and pens with you so that you can make a mark right please make sure that you make a note of the pointers that I tell you about and I will be discussing concepts that are relevant on a board examination front so I need 45 minutes of your time undivided attention okay undivided attention into what I am speaking what I am explaining what I am revising right because life process is not a chapter that you are going to read for the first time right but life chapter is going to be a chapter we will keep revising until we learn right and for those of you who might be feeling ma'am I might be wasting my time trust me you will not be wasting your time you will definitely be learning and revising yes so everybody please make sure these are things I'm telling you now only so that later on when you ask me midway why you didn't do this why you didn't do that I am letting you know right this is how we're going to do it 
So let's get started everybody with life processes. So what do we mean by life processes, right? So we know that life processes are nothing but those processes that are ne needed for the maintenance of our body and for the survival, right? So whether we are just simply sitting or we're walking around doing any activity, we know that there are some processes that need to happen at all times. So how do we define life processes? They can be simply defined as the basic processes that are necessary for survival, right? And of course, there are important life processes that we know. But in this chapter, we are covering four important life processes. That is nutrition, respiration, transportation and excretion. So let's get started with nutrition. Now we know that for any activity to happen in our body, there needs to be a fuel that drives our body. And food that we eat is the fuel that drives our body. And how do we obtain this food? We obtain it by nutrition, right? So what, how can we define nutrition? Nutrition can be simply defined as the mode of intake of food and its utilization right so that is how we define nutrition now we know that there are two modes of nutrition where we have autotrophic mode of nutrition and we have heterotrophic mode of nutrition now autotrophic mode of nutrition is one wherein organisms have the ability to prepare their own food right they're not dependent on anybody else they can prepare their own food from simple inorganic substances right so from simple inorganic substances they are able to prepare their own food while in the case of heterotrophic mode of nutrition we see that these guys or these organisms that exhibit this are dependent on other organisms for their mode of nutrition yes so now when we talk about autotrophic mode of organisms and those that prepare their own food we know that these are nothing but the green plants and green plants prepare their own food by the process of photosynthesis yes so they prepare their own food by the process of photosynthesis now, how can we define this process of photosynthesis? It is the process by which carbon dioxide and water will combine in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, giving us glucose, right? Or it produces glucose and it gives out oxygen as a byproduct along with some amount of water. Now, it is important to balance out the equation as well. So here I'm quickly balancing it out as well, right? So you need to have a balanced equation, right? Now, how does this happen? How does this process of photosynthesis take place? It takes place in three steps, right? So the first step is where there is absorption of light energy by chlorophyll. Now we know that we have the raw materials that are there, which are your carbon dioxide and water, right? Now carbon dioxide that is there is present in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide enters into the plants through these small tiny pores called as stomata right so we know that stomata are small tiny pores which are present on the underside of the leaves and they enter in through there and we also know that water that is there is absorbed by the roots and it is transported to the upper parts through the xylem right and we know that the xylem will transport it and they will reach the leaves now, once it has reached, we also know that sunlight is extremely essential. Yes, and this chlorophyll that is there will absorb the sunlight. And this light energy that is there is converted into chemical energy, starting with the splitting of water molecules into water and oxygen. And we see that this hydrogen also that give is released out, right? That is there. So this is not water and oxygen, but it is, of course, we have hydrogen and hydroxyl. And then, of course, we know that reduction of carbon dioxide takes place into carbohydrates, right? So these are the three steps that are there. And that's how at the end of it, we get glucose. Now, glucose is necessary for producing energy and carrying out various other activities. And we see that excess of glucose that is there is then converted into starch. And this right here is how it is stored in the plant body. So this right here is a quick synopsis of what is photosynthesis and the important pointers you must be able to go, right? Now on the other hand, as you know, right, we know that we also need to have an understanding of this so that experiments related to photosynthesis can be easy, yes? So now let's move on to heterotrophic mode of nutrition.
Now talking about heterotrophic mode of nutrition, we know that there are various modes of heterotrophic mode of nutrition or different types of heterotrophic mode of nutrition. So in this case, we see that there is saprophytic mode of nutrition, parasitic mode and holozoic mode, right? So what is saprophytic mode of nutrition? In saprophytic mode of nutrition, we know that these are organisms that feed on dead and decaying organisms. And here we see that these organisms will release certain enzymes or they will release certain chemicals outside their body. They will break down the food outside their body and then they will absorb it, right? So normally we observe that organisms like fungi exhibit this mode of nutrition. Then of course, as you know, we have parasitic mode of nutrition where there are animals like ticks or tapeworms. And then of course, we have plants like cascuta, which are found to be dependent on another organism entirely and they take the nutrition from the host organism and here as you know this, this uh, organism that is deriving the nutrition is called as a parasite and the organism from which it is taking its food is called as a host organism and this mode of nutrition is parasitic right so now as we know this is all about saprotrophic and parasitic now, in holozoic mode of nutrition, we see that organisms will take in their food, right? So, they will ingest the food and then they will break down the food within their body. So, breakdown happens internally, right? And this mode of nutrition is what we call as holozoic mode of nutrition. So, are we clear so far, everybody? Give me a quick thumbs up in the chat. Are we clear? Yes? This is a live class, but first we are going to recall the concepts. Whatever doubts you have, please make sure you write it down and towards the end, I will clarify your doubts, okay? So please make sure that you keep listening to what I am saying and whatever doubts that are there, I will keep clarifying it towards the end, yes? And again, a quick reminder, I see a lot of you saying, Ma'am, Hindi mein samjhaiye. See, again, like I told you, you have to write your answers in English, okay? And you start, you need to become more and more comfortable with English, right? So I will primarily teach in English and later on whatever you have not understood in the end I will teach in Hindi okay keep this in mind and we're going to move on yes very good bachas very good so now let's move on to holozoic mode of nutrition in great detail right so in holozoic mode of nutrition we know that there are five steps of nutrition where we have index in ingestion digestion absorption assimilation and ingestion now, ingestion is nothing but taking in of food, right? So, taking in of food. And digestion is a very important definition that you need to know. So, what is digestion? Digestion is nothing but the breakdown of complex substances or complex substances in food into simple soluble forms right so that is what we mean by digestion it is the breakdown of complex substances in food into simple soluble forms and once it is broken down into simple soluble forms it is then absorbed into the body and then it is assimilated or it is utilized right and finally whatever undigested part is there it is removed out by the process of ejection now, holozoic mode of nutrition is something we see both in amoeba, unicellular organisms like amoeba and in multicellular organisms and like in our case in humans, right? So, these are the two cases that we've learnt about. Now, in the case of amoeba, right? So, when we talk about amoeba, things you need to remember. We know that there is usage of pseudopodia in the formation of a food vacuole. So that's how they ingest their food. Then we know that a food vacuole is formed wherein digestion takes place. And at the end of the day, it is then, uh, you know, the food vacuole will release out the digestive substances and then it's transported to different parts. And of course, whatever is not necessary is ingested out, right? So that is what you need to know about amoeba. Two things, pseudopodia and food vacuole are the things you need to know. Now, of course, when we go ahead and we start looking at holozoic mode of nutrition in organisms like us, in humans, we know that we have a digestive system that helps us to do all of these steps, right? And we know that the digestive system that is there has two parts. We know that there is an alimentary canal. And then, of course, we know that there is also the accessory glands, right? So we have the alimentary canal or the associated glands or the accessory glands. 
Now, when we talk about the elementary canal, it starts with the buccal cavity, right? Now, your buccal cavity mainly includes two things. Yes, I mean three things. Your buccal cavity includes teeth, tongue and saliva. Now, the teeth that are there will help in cutting and biting the food and chewing it and breaking it down physically. Then you have the tongue that helps in moving the food and mixing the food with saliva. And we know that the saliva that is there is produced by the salivary glands, right? Now, there are three pairs of salivary glands glands and we know that saliva is a watery fluid which also has an enzyme. Now what is an enzyme? I'm sure all of you must be asking this so I'm writing this definition down at the bottom. Now an enzyme is nothing but a biocatalyst. That means that an enzyme will increase the rate of a chemical reaction but it will not get involved in it, right? And because it it's present in our body, we call it as a biocatalyst. Now, in saliva, we see that there is salivary amylase which is present, right? And we see that this salivary amylase that is there is responsible for breaking down starch into simpler sugars. Mind you, I am not saying simple sugar, I am saying simpler sugars, right? And we see that this breakdown starts from our mouth itself, right? And we see that the saliva, I mean the tongue will then bind the chewed food and the saliva, resulting in the formation of a bolus. And once we swallow it, it will then move on to the next part, which is the esophagus or the food pipe. Right? And we know that from the food pipe, it will then go on to this flattened J-shaped structure called as stomach. Now, the movement of food along the elementary canal, right? So, the movement of food along the elementary canal happens by a process of peristalsis, right? What is peristalsis? Peristalsis is the movement by which there is, which is caused by the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the muscles, which results in a wave-like motion, right? So, that is what we mean by it. And we see that through peristalsis, it will move throughout the elementary canal. Now, once it has reached the stomach, right? Once it has reached the stomach, we know that the stomach will now secrete some juices. And we call this as the gastric juices that are there. Now, the gastric juices has three things. We have hydrochloric acid, there is mucus, and there is an enzyme which is known as pepsin. Now, the hydrochloric acid that is there will destroy any unwanted particle that has entered along with the food. And of course, it will activate the enzyme pepsin. Now, mucus will protect the inner linings of the stomach from the acid. And we see that pepsin will act on proteins and it will facilitate the breakdown into smaller proteins, right? Or what we call as peptides. And we know that here it will take, you know, it will churn the food for about 3 to 4 hours, right? And from here, it will then move on to the intestine. Now, once it moves on to the intestine, we see that the initial, the intestine, where, I mean, the next part it will go to is the small intestine, right? And the initial part of the small intestine will receive secretion from pancreas as well as liver and gallbladder. Now, here we see that the liver that is there will produce something called as bile juice. Now, bile juice has two things to do, right? So, bile juice will also provide or make the medium alkaline for the acting of the pancreas, the juices, I mean the enzymes which are present in the pancreas, right? And we also see that it facilitates a process called as emulsification. Now, what is emulsification? Emulsification is nothing but the conversion of large droplets of fat into simple or smaller droplets to be precise, right? Understand that this is not a digestion process, right? Large droplets of fat size wise that are there are getting broken down into smaller droplets. And this is what we understand as emulsification. And emulsification is extremely necessary because enzymes that act on fat cannot act on it until it has been emulsified, right? So this is a very, very important step. Now, we also see that it receives secretion from pancreas, right? Now, we know that pancreas are responsible for producing 
pancreatic juice right and what is present in this pancreatic juice pancreatic juice has many enzymes in it okay there are many many enzymes and on board examination front you don't need to learn all of the names but what you need to know is that these enzymes will act on carbohydrates right it will act on proteins and they will act on fats okay this is something that you need to know this is what the pancreas and the pancreatic juice do and we also know that there is gallbladder and we know that gallbladder will do what gallbladder will store the excess bile right so whatever excess bile that is produced by the liver it will store it so this is what the function is okay now from here of course in the small intestine complete digestion of food takes place right so complete digestion of food takes place and of course we know that in the inner linings of the small intestine we have finger like projections called as villi that will absorb this right it will absorb the digested food and then it will transport it so we also know that villi are richly supplied with blood vessels and it will through the blood the digested food is then transported to different parts of our body where it is utilized now whatever unwanted part that is there the undigested food that is there will i mean the remaining part will go into the large intestine and in the large intestine water and some necessary substances are reabsorbed and undigested food is removed out through the anus right so with this if you see we've had a quick revision of nutrition right and i know we've taken 15 minutes into this but nonetheless i hope now we are clear and we have only discussed points that are necessary on a board examination front so now what we are going to do is we will go ahead and have a look at respiration again i can see lot of doubts coming in the chat but just keep writing your doubts in your notebook together i will clarify it in the end okay and in the meanwhile keep liking this video do not forget to like right all right so now we will move on to respiration right now what is respiration that is there respiration is nothing but the breakdown of glucose in order to release energy right so if we need to carry out any activity right whatever activity is there whether it's a physical activity or it's a chemical activity which is there within our body it requires energy and our body is able to achieve this energy by carrying out the process of respiration and since this process of respiration happens inside the cell we call it as cellular respiration right so we call this process as cellular respiration okay now when we talk about respiration we know that in respiration there is break breakdown of glucose now glucose right here is a six carbon molecule okay remember this glucose is a six carbon molecule and it's not that when i say breakdown of glucose to release energy it is a single step process there are many steps that keep taking place all right many many steps that are there now one thing is that the first thing that happens is glucose will first get converted into something known as pyruvate okay and we see that this conversion or this process of conversion of glucose into pyruvate takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell all right so this happens in the cytoplasm remember this write it down somewhere you might get this question in your boards right conversion of glucose into pyruvate happens in the cytoplasm now most often than not right in our body we see that this glucose gets broken down into pyruvate and then this pyruvate is taken to where it is taken to the mitochondria which is called as the power house of the cell right it's a cell organelle where this is completely broken down in order to release energy and we see that this energy is released in the form of atp what is atp atp is adenosine triphosphate right atp is adenosine triphosphate now as you know right uh, as you know what happens is that this complete breakdown is taking place in the presence of oxygen right and which is why we call this mode of respiration as aerobic respiration yes so this is what we call as aerobic respiration because the breakdown is taking place in the presence of oxygen 
Now, at times in our body, it can also happen in anaerobic conditions, right? Or in the lack of oxygen or in the temporary absence of it, right? So, in anaerobic condition, it is happening due to lack or temporary absence. And as a result, in our muscle cells, especially during extreme activities or, you know, when doing strenuous physical activity, pyruvate will then get converted into lactic acid and then release energy. But this is relatively lesser amount of energy. Now, we also see anaerobic respiration taking place in other organisms like yeast, where we see that glucose will be broken down, releasing ethanol. And when ethanol or alcohol is produced, carbon dioxide is also released and it gives out energy. And this process of anaerobic respiration, when it is carried out by yeast, it is called as fermentation. Very good, very good. So, this is about the basics of air respiration and the types of respiration. Now we need to focus on aerobic respiration, especially in our body. Now in aerobic respiration, we also see that oxygen is a key factor. Now we know where glucose is coming from. Glucose is coming from the digested food and it is transported to the cells. But where is this oxygen coming from? Oxygen is a gas which is present on our surroundings, right? Which is why we have a human respiratory system that facilitates the intake of this air that is rich in oxygen and it makes sure that our cells have oxygen for this process, right? Now in this case, if you see, we see that the human respiratory system starts with the nostrils. Now, what are nostrils? Nostrils are nothing but two openings which are present in our nose and through the nostrils, it will enter into the nasal cavity, right? And the inner linings of the nasal cavity have hair and it produces mucus and it traps any unwanted substances which might enter along with the air. Okay, and from here we know that it will then move on to pharynx which is a common opening and then it will move on to the larynx which is the voice box. Then it will go into the trachea which is also known as the windpipe and here we see that it will bifurcate into bronchi, right? Single term is bronchus, plural is bronchi, okay? And then it will enter into the spongy structures called as lungs. Now, the bronchi inside will keep bifurcating further and further, ending in air sac-like structures known as alveoli, right? So, going back quickly, it ends in alveoli. Now, these alveoli that are there are rich, are, you know, balloon-like structures which are richly supplied with blood vessels, okay? So, we see that they are richly supplied with blood vessels. Now, when we breathe in air, okay, or when we take in air, Air that enters is rich in oxygen, alright? So we see that it is rich in oxygen. But the blood that comes to the alveoli, we see that that is more rich in carbon dioxide, okay? So we see that this right here will have more amount of carbon dioxide that is bringing the carbon dioxide that it brings from different cells, yes? So inside the alveoli, we see that there is more oxygen and we see that there is more carbon dioxide in the blood. And by the process of diffusion, right, we see that oxygen and carbon dioxide move. So oxygen moves from alveoli into blood vessels while carbon dioxide moves from blood vessels into the alveoli. And this process is what we call as diffusion where there is movement of substances from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration, right? So this is how we know. And here, of course, we know that the blood that is there has red blood cells, right? And we know that red blood cells are what is responsible for transporting oxygen, yes? And these red blood cells have a pigment called as hemoglobin that have high affinity to oxygen. And that is how they are able to transport it. And normally, the carbon dioxide that is there is because it is easily dissolvable in water, it is transported by the blood, okay? All right. So now, of course, as you know, once this happens, all this carbon dioxide is then expelled out. Now, we know that air entering and leaving the body is what we call as inhalation and exhalation, right? And we know that this inhalation and exhalation happens by the process of breathing. So when we breathe in, we know that there is a muscular dome-shaped structure called as diaphragm, which is responsible for separating the thoracic cavity, or I'll simply say the chest cavity and the abdomen, right? It is responsible for separating these two. Now, when we inhale, right, we see that the diaphragm will contract and move downwards and we know that the ribcage will move outwards and as a result, air will enter. 
but when we exhale no or in order to exhale the diaphragm will go upwards the rib cage will come inwards and of course we see that we will be able to exhale out so these are the basics that you need to understand about mechanism of breathing and one more pointer on an examination front that you need to know is difference in breathing rate between terrestrial and aquatic organisms everybody in your textbooks please make a note of this star mark this okay so when we talk about terrestrial and aquatic we know aquatic organisms like fishes don't have lungs but we know that instead they have something known as gills right and we know that these gills of course help in this process now we see that the breathing rate in aquatic animals is more when compared to terrestrial animals because in water the dissolved oxygen that is there is very less when compared compared to how much oxygen we would find in land right which is why they tend to breathe more pump a lot of blood to their body so that they have sufficient oxygen to carry it out yes very good very good so with this everybody all my bachas give me a quick thumbs up in the chat are we clear with nutrition and respiration right i am sure all of you will have good number of doubts right so are we clear are we clear give me a thumbs up just keep paying attention see today if you are not able to follow my pace right later on you can rewatch this video where you you know reduce the pace and you play it slow so that you will be able to understand so don't get worked up thinking that are ma'am is going very fast this is quick revision right yes wonderful bachas wonderful so please make sure you are constantly liking this video as well do not forget to like the video do not forget to subscribe as well this is very important yes so now we are going to move on to the next one kirti i can see all of your questions my bachcha i will answer your doubts also let me finish revising the chapter and then i will come to all of your doubts okay that's my promise to you yes okay all right now moving on to transportation yes transportation is very simple it is one of the simpler parts and the easiest parts also right so now if you see in nutrition we saw that there is breakdown of food substances into simpler forms so we know that all our nutrients are coming from nutrition right or we are getting it at the end from respiration we know that there you know uh, there is energy which is produced and of course we also see that for this oxygen is necessary but in all cases these things need to be transported from different parts and they need to reach the cell and how is that happening that is happening by transportation right now transportation that is there is something that we not only see in animals but we see in plants also right so it is something we observe both in plants as well as in humans now when we talk about transport in plants right this is very simple and easy yes transport in plants we know that substances that need to be transported include water right so we see that it includes water it includes minerals and it includes the food that is being produced right so now when we talk about transport of water and minerals we see that xylem is a very important structure now xylem is a complex uh, permanent tissue that is present which is made up of different structures such as tracheids vessels xylem parenchyma and xylem fibers and your tracheids and vessels are what are mainly responsible for transport of water and minerals now we see that how is this water actually being transported right how exactly is it getting transported so now we know that water is essential for the process of photosynthesis we already know about this right so we know that water that is there is essential for photosynthesis now water of course gets absorbed by the roots it is then transported and taken to the leaves now most often than not we see that there is excess of water that gets transported and excess water that reaches the leaf that is there we know that is removed right is removed in the form of water vapor right and we know that this process is nothing but transpiration what is transpiration removal of excess water in the form of water vapor from the aerial parts of the plant right 
Now what happens is that when this water is removed in the form of water vapor, it creates a suction pull, right? Or it creates a suction force. Kind of like how, what force would get created if you take a straw and you suck the water, right? So if you take a straw, put it in a glass of water and if you suck it, that's the suction force essentially. So what happens is that this suction force is created due to transpiration, which is why we also call it as the transpirational pull right so we call this as transpirational pull now as a result we know that water gets absorbed reaches the aerial parts and we know that this is how continuously water gets transported and yes transport in xylem is unidirectional and now we know why it is unidirectional right so this right here again is very very important now we also know that in the leaves, right, we know that there is production of food, yes? So food gets synthesized by the process of photosynthesis, no? Now food that is there needs to go to the upper parts of the plant as well as the lower parts of the plant. Which is why we see that transport of food substances like glucose, amino acids and various other substances are done by phloem. And as you know, phloem that is there is made up of sieve tubes, companion cells, phloem parenchyma and phloem fibers, right? So this is very, very important. Now in the case of phloem, right, we see that for transport of food takes place by a process known as translocation. Right, so what is translocation? It is nothing but the transport of food in transport of food through phloem, right? Now in this case, if you observe, we see that energy in the form of ATP is required. So energy is utilized for this process. Now when I was explaining transport or this transpirational pull and like how Kirti has mentioned ascent of sap, right? So during ascent of sap, what we see is that there is no energy that is getting consumed. But in this case, we see that energy is getting consumed, right? And here of course, we also see that it goes from a region of low concentration to high concentration, creating an osmotic pressure. So these are some few key pointers you should remember. See what exactly I have told you are the key pointers you must remember when you are studying for your boards, especially with respect to transport in plants. Okay, so this is all about how transport in plants takes place. Now let's quickly move on to transport in animals and understand about how transport takes place in our body, right? Now in our body, we have an exclusive system that helps us out, which is the human circulatory system. Right now, the components of human circulatory system include three things. Yes, so here I, we see that it includes blood, it includes blood vessels, and it includes the heart. Right now, blood that is here is the fluid connective tissue. Yes, so we see that this right here is the fluid connective tissue right and we know that blood has a fluid part which is plasma and it has various blood cells also so we have rbc we have wbc and we have platelets now the rbc's that are there are the red blood cells which are responsible for transporting oxygen right so this right here is very important now the wbc's or the white blood cells that are there are responsible for d Fence, right so they right here this right here is very important now we have platelets now platelets play a key role in blood clotting so if at all we get an injury or we hurt ourselves then we know that it can lead to blood clotting and that is taken care of by the platelets now we also know that one of the primary functions of the blood especially is transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide now for this we have specialized tubes or structures which are known as blood vessels. Now there are three kinds of blood vessels, okay? So we have arteries, we have veins and of course we have capillaries. Now the arteries are most often than not defined as blood vessels that transports blood away from the heart to different parts of the body. And mainly, right, most arteries are responsible for transporting oxygen-rich blood or what we call as oxygenated blood, 
okay again understand and remember i'm telling you most arteries are responsible for this and because they transport blood away from the heart right we see that they uh, and because they transport blood away from the heart blood flows with very high pressure inside the arteries right and in this case we see that there are no valves or flap like structures present in arteries now when we move on to veins right when we talk about veins we see that these are structures which bring blood from different parts of the body towards the heart okay and most veins that are there transport blood which has more carbon dioxide okay it has more carbon dioxide because it's bringing from different parts of the body right while on the other hand we see that this kind of blood is what we call as deoxygenated blood and now as you know because it's coming from different organs and not from the heart it's not emerging from the heart we see that blood flows with low pressure right and in order to prevent backflow of blood valves are present yes so these are the main points of difference between veins and arteries and this can be a question that you can get for 3 marks to differentiate between arteries and veins right then you have capillaries right now when we talk about capillaries yes so let me use another color so capillaries that are there are nothing but thin walled structures okay they are thin walled and they are so thin that they are just one single cell thick all right and we see that capillaries are where we observe exchange okay so exchange of gases oxygen going from the blood carbon dioxide entering into the blood all takes place at the you know capillaries right so this is the main function that you know, need to know with respect to capillaries so now we have looked at blood and we have looked at blood vessels now the main organ of the circulatory system that is there and you, please everybody take a screenshot of this very quickly or you can come back and take a screenshot because this slide might not come back again so you can take a screenshot for our foot right so now coming back the main organ that is there is nothing but the heart right now when we talk about the heart and especially the human heart we know that the human heart is a four chambered heart right so we see that it has a four chambered heart now quickly to use a simpler as uh, image to explain this there are two upper chambers and these two upper chambers are what we call as the atria or the atrium and there are two bottom chambers which we call as the ventricles right so the atria i always say are the receiving chambers and the ventricles that are there are the pumping chambers now apart from this we also see that the heart is divided into the right side and the left side right so we see that it is divided into right side and left side now the right side mainly receives deoxygenated blood and the left side receives oxygenated blood okay so now in this case if you see we have the right atrium we have the right ventricle the left atrium and the left ventricle now between the right atrium and the right ventricle we see that there is a tricuspid valve which prevents backflow and between the left atrium and the left ventricle we also see that there is the bicuspid valve which prevents backflow now understanding the remaining blood vessels with double circulation becomes easy right so now we know right okay going back we know that the right side of the heart right so when we look at the right side it receives the deoxygenated blood from different parts of the body through one of the largest veins that are there which is the vena cava and we have two kinds of vena cava which is the inferior and the superior and the inferior superior means from the top parts right superior means top so from the top parts of the body it brings deoxygenated blood while inferior vena cava brings in the deoxygenated blood from the bottom parts right and we know that it will bring it to the right atrium now the right atrium will then transport it to the right ventricle now the right ventricle will pump this blood all the way to the lungs for oxygenation and the blood vessel that is responsible for transporting it from the heart to the lungs is the pulmonary artery and pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that transports deoxygenated blood okay and once it reaches the lungs we know that alveoli are there oxygenation takes place and from here we see that there is a blood vessel which is the pulmonary vein which is the only vein in the body that transports oxygenated blood now it is rich in oxygen no now this will come to the left atrium 
and left atrium will pump it to the left ventricle and from the left ventricle we see that the aorta which is the largest artery in the body will transport oxygenated blood to different parts. Now here if you see the same blood is entering into the heart twice. So this is what we define as double circulation of blood. When the same blood enters the heart twice, we call this as double circulation, right? And here we see that there are two circuits which are present, right? We see that there is a pulmonary circuit which is the circulation that exists between the lungs and the heart and then of course we have the systemic circuit which, ex which, which is a circulation that exists between the heart and the body. What do capillaries do? They are responsible for exchange of gases. They facilitate exchange of gases, right? So with this, if you see, we have recall transportation, everyone. Are we clear with this? Are we clear with transportation? Have we recalled it? Give me a quick thumbs up in the chat. Everyone, fada fad, give me thumbs up. Why is it called pulmonary? Because it is going to and, you know, it's going between the lungs, no heart and lungs. Pulmon means lungs, right? That's why pulmonary. Yes, very good, very good. Now, I hope all of you have liked the video and you have subscribed to the channel, okay? Do not forget to like this video, yes? Okay, very good. So, now we will quickly move on to the last part which is excretion. I will finish this in 5 minutes, okay? 5 minutes and I will keep 10 minutes for doubt solving. So, stay focused, bacha, stay focused, okay? Now, we are going to be looking at excretion. What is excretion? Excretion is nothing but removal of nitrogenous metabolic waste from the body, right? So this is what we understand as excretion. Now, excretion is necessary to happen inside our body because we know that nitrogen is metabolic waste. If it accumulates within our body, it can be toxic and hence it needs to be removed periodically from our body. Now, it's not just in our body, in plants also, it needs to be there, right? So, we know that in the case of plants, right, unnecessary or remove whatever metabolic waste that is there is removed either in the form of salt or it can be loss of water because at the end of the day, excess water is not needed by the plant and we know that by transpiration, it is removed, right? Resins and gums are like these sticky substance through which they get rid of unnecessary things. Even oxygen that is produced as a byproduct of photosynthesis, we see that that also can be considered as a metabolic waste which is removed out through diffusion and sometimes whatever old parts are there we know that they will be shed off now in the case of humans we know that there is an excretory system which is involved right so we see that the excretory system and the main excretory organ right so we see that the main excretory organ that is there are the kidneys and we see that we have a pair of kidneys which are located in the abdomen region and we also see that from the kidney there are these long tubular structures called the ureter which bring in and then of course I mean we have the ureter then we have the urinary bladder and finally the urethra. Now we know that the toxic meta I mean the nitrogenous metabolic waste from our body is removed in the form of urine and we know that urine formation takes place inside the filtration units called as nephron. So nephrons can be defined as the filtration units, filtration units or we also call them as the structural and functional unit of the kidneys. Now the structure of the nephron here is very very important on a board examination front. They can ask you the difference between nephron and neuron also so remember this okay. Where is the kidney situated? In the abdominal region. Now, if you look at the structure of nephron, we see that it has a glomerulus, which is a, you know, a tuft of capillaries or you can say that it is a network of capillaries, all right? And this is like a, you know, like a ball of capillaries, which is sitting on a Bowman's capsule. And we see that when we say that, uh, you know, glomerulus is a, uh, what do you say, like a ball of capillaries, right? We see here that the blood is what brings in all this toxic material, okay? And we see that here in this Bowman's capsule, we see that ultra filtration takes place, okay? So kind of think like your water filter. Know how the water filter will remove all the unnecessary things and it will filter out only what is good. 
and because this filtration is happening in the glomerulus we call it as glomerular filtrate right and this filtration takes place at very high pressure at high pressure it will be filtering out which is why we also call it as ultra filtration because it's taking place at very high pressure now we see that once it is filtered out we also see that all this you know unnecessary toxic metabolic substance which in our body is in the form of urea urea along with you know sometimes glucose amino acids water all of this will get filtered okay now glucose amino acid water and all is very important to our body right which is why in the tubules they will get reabsorbed and whatever excess water is there sometimes might get secreted back but nonetheless it will be filtered out and at the end of it we see that urine is formed by by the time it reaches this part and then of course it goes into the collecting duct and all these collecting ducts that are there no they will pour their secretion and all this urine that is there let me just ha huh. all that urine is then poured from the kidneys into the ureter then it will go into the urinary bladder where it is stored for a brief amount of time and once it is the right time a message will be sent to the brain and then it will signal the muscles here to relax and through the urethra it will be expelled out yes so everybody with this we have revised full life process not in 45 minutes but to be honest yeah roughly keeping 5 minutes apart i have actually finished this in 45 minutes so now everyone are we clear are we clear with what we have learnt so this is a quick recall for all of you right so on nutrition on respiration transportation and excretion yes are we feeling confident with life processes i will take your doubts right now okay now i know there were a lot of doubts मैम आपसे कुछ पूछना है जरूर पूछिए मैम लिम्फ ओके सी लिम्फ आई नो इज अ वेरी ट्रिकी कॉन्सेप्ट ऑल राइट नाउ इन द कैपिलरीज राइट वेन ब्लड इज फ्लोइंग समटाइम्स देर आर सम leaks okay kind of like a leaky pipe no so when there are leaky pipes that are there what happens is that through these leaky pipes sometimes some plasma or sometimes some wbcs will squeeze out all right now these capillaries are also surrounding blood vessels no so what happens is that this all this plasma and everything will start surrounding here it will go around the cells which is what we call as the extracellular fluid now it is outside the cell so it is extracellular fluid now what will happen is that this is not very good for the body now it's out of balance which is why most often then not the remaining ones will go back inside the blood channels but the remaining plasma wbc some proteins they will all get redirected into another vessel it's not a blood vessel but it's another vessel in the body which we call as a lymph vessel okay and this fluid inside the lymph vessel is what we call as lymph okay all right okay kartik uh, i hope that um, you know you can send that doubt to me in the comment section i will answer ma'am how does transpiration help in movement because it creates a suction okay it will create a suction force and that's why the water will go up that's how transpiration helps in movement of water ma'am why is pancreas known as dual function because pancreas not only secrete you know digestive juices we have also learnt in control coordination that it also secretes hormones right so it is a exoendocrine gland okay yes ma'am starch is broken down into simple sugar in the intestine also yes it is so we have amylase pancreatic amylase that converts starch into maltose that also happens translocation translocation that is there is nothing but when transport of food takes place right so we know that food is transported from the leaves into the phloem by translocation ma'am complete digestion to nahi hoga bachas if you have directed doubts ask me but digestion is nothing but the process of breakdown of food into simple soluble forms right ma'am in how many seconds i actually uh, ma'am glomerulus once again okay see glomerulus that is there we see that it is a okay so as you know glomerulus that is there is a network of capillaries all right and blood will be flowing through it now there is a difference in the diameter of the blood vessel that the tubes that are starting the glomerulus and ending it right and here as you know as the blood grows through this there will be very high pressure and as a result it will act as a filter and all this urea glucose amino acids all these chotu chotu molecules will get filtered in 
okay so here we see that mainly here glomerulus act, acts as a filter which is why we call it as filtration transpiration is loss of excess water from the aerial parts of the plant trans that is transpiration transportation is transport of water and minerals and food substances to different parts right ma'am will they ask us to write experiments no they will not ask you to write experiments but they'll ask you questions based on it yes ma'am heart explanation whoa oh, oh. so i you want structure of heart or you want um, what is it that you want heart is a very easy you know broad way of telling Yes, ma'am, systolic and diastolic. See, systolic and diastolic is not really part of your syllabus. But see, systolic pressure is the pressure which is exerted when there is contraction, right? So when the uh, atria contract, right? I mean, uh, so when we see that when there is contraction, it is systolic pressure. So when atria will contract, we see that that time the uh, ventricles will relax, right? And when ventricles will contract, atria will relax. So systolic pressure is the pressure that exerts during contraction. Diastolic pressure is exerted during relaxation, right? Okay. Ma'am, is there any example for lymphatic system? There is example for lymphatic organ and that is spleen, okay? Ma'am, how do tall trees? Tall trees by ascent of sat, I have already explained. Next SST session will be sometime this week or next week. I'm not sure, Bharat. Ma'am, what is the function of petiole midrib veins? They are, PTOL or your veins have both your, uh, you know, transporting tissue, right? It has both uh, xylem and phloem. Ma'am, explain breakdown of glucose. Okay, there are two questions. I will try my best, Bachas, in whatever I am able to answer, okay? Whatever I am able to answer, I will do because Arsh ma'am and Ankita ma'am are waiting for your next class. But don't worry, we will have more and more classes, so don't worry, okay? Yes, reproductive system and I do, how do organisms reproduce? Not now. So heart as we know is a four chambered heart. It has two parts on top. Okay. This is called as the atria which are the receiving chambers. That means they receive blood. Alright. And the bottom two chambers that are there are called as the ventricles. And they are called as the pumping chambers. Right. That means their job is to pump. Okay. Now apart from this we also see that the heart is divided into right side. And it is divided into left side. Okay. Why is it divided into right and left? For separating. Uh, so, that, so that there is no mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated. Right. So in this case if you see right side receives deoxygenated blood. And left side receives oxygenated. Yes. Now we see that this is the basic structure. So we have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium and left ventricle. Right. Okay. Now along with this what we also observe is that there are valves which are present. So between these two we have the tricuspid valve and between these two we have the bicuspid valve. Okay. Alright ma'am what are valves I have already written. Yes. Now my team members are also here threatening me to finish. So I hope most of your doubts are here for double circulation. Please go rewind and you can check it out. You will be able to find it. Okay. Residual volume is the volume that is remaining in the lungs. Okay, yes, one more minute. I'll take one last question. One last question. Yes, ma'am, double circulation plus diagram, too much for me to explain in under one minute. Someone was asking me, ma'am, what are red blood corpuscles? Red blood corpuscles are nothing but red blood cells. What are uh, villi? Villi are the finger-like projections of the inner walls of the small intestine that are richly supplied with blood vessels and that help in absorption. Yes? All right, everybody. So with this, I am going to be winding it up. Here's a quick reminder for all of you on Parent Club. As you know, Chetna Ma'am is coming live once again on 21st December at 6 p.m. Where we will understand why goal setting is important, right? So very quickly, everybody, try this out. Here's a reminder for Baiju Spoken English classes. And if you found this class helpful, let me know in the comments. If there are some doubts that you still have which you want me to help you out with, let me know in the comments. It's important, right? Whatever doubts are there, I will answer in the comments. That's my promise to you. But you have to drop the comment. So everybody, the smart list playlist is also there. Do not forget to like, share and subscribe to this channel because now you know Baiju's 9 and 10 has got you covered no matter what, right? Yes, okay. Alright everybody, I will see you all very very soon again. Up until then, take care.